Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Real World Perspectives on Poverty Solutions Speaker Series. Um, I'm so excited that you're here today um, to hear this presentation um, from Adam Seltzer, the co-founder of Sevilla in Detroit. Uh, I want to start today um, somewhat uh, uh, atypically by showing you my socks. Yes, please. So they say Sevilla on them. Oh, yeah. And Rachel is going to stand up and show you. Uh, yes. We are in the business of socks and sweatshirts. That's what we do. Our team at Poverty Solutions went to Sevilla this summer and had a really wonderful day learning from the team there, who we've partnered with at a number of points, um, building websites that make it easier for people to access information. Um, and so uh, we worked with them on a COVID project um, and I think also on a, um, another child project. Um, and so we're 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 really excited to be there. Um, my the Poverty Solutions team is over here. You can wave to everybody. And Woo! one of the things that we were really impressed with when we were there <laughs> was um, Sevilla's practice of kind of engaging their mission statement very directly, um, kind of at the beginning and end of each day. And 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 um, we were really impressed by that. Karen and I have had a lot of conversations of just how inspired we are from being at Sevilla. Um, so I am really excited to have Adam here to talk to us today. Um, Adam has a lot of um, past lives that are very interesting. Um, he was a musician for a while. He um, was uh, worked at the, the design school at um, Stanford um, and has been a design um, designer for the United Way. Um, so of Southeast Michigan. Um, and so I could go on for a while, but that's not why you're here. So I'm going to stop talking and turn it over to Adam, who we're really excited to have here. Let's welcome him. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, thanks for having me. You know, I, uh, my wife and I have now lived in Michigan for nine years, and I spent not nearly enough time on the campus of the University of Michigan. So I'm really glad to be here. Um, and I was delighted to be asked. Um, the talk today is called The Power in a Single Story, Scaling Social Change by Focusing on Individuals. Uh, we'll talk more about what that means, but, you know, there are two, two words or notions in that introduction that sometimes are at um, odds with one another. One of them is scaling, and the other is individuals. And um, what I hope we can have a conversation about uh, at the end of this presentation um, is some of your thoughts about maybe some of the untapped power and potential when we talk about social programs that um, are designed for populations and that are governed by public policies. All these are things that end up orienting towards such large numbers of people that the individual um, is easily lost somehow. And so what I'd like to do um, with the time that I have with you um, is to, well, I'll share a little bit about my story. I know that when I was in school, it was always helpful hearing um, stories of different paths that people took, especially as, as you're kind of governing your own sense on, on a path forward. So I'll share a little bit about that. I'll share a little bit about the founding of the organization that I'm here representing by way of socks and sweatshirts. That's called Sevilla. Uh, we're a nonprofit design studio operating in Detroit. Um, but really, I want to spend time walking you through um, the story of the first work that we did at, as, as a design team. Um, and we found ourselves talking about that project and teaching from it um, for years now. And we just keep finding new um, things to learn and share from that work. So that'll be the bulk of what I introduce. Um, and then there's time, you know, for question and answer. And if you're like me, that's always the most interesting part of the whole thing. Um, and so I'd be delighted if, as I'm going through this, if you end up jotting down some questions or some ideas or pushes for me, um, that would be very welcome. Um, yeah. The sound all right? Yeah. Okay. So I promised, um, this one had more hair on the top of my head, um, a little bit of a story about me. Um, you know, I spent a majority of my 20s making rock and roll music, and I never felt much of an affinity for school. I never um, felt like I did particularly well in school settings. Um, 
And so it wasn't until my mid-20s that I ended up returning back to school, graduating with a college degree. And at that point, you know, graduate school was an option for the first time in my life. And for a long time, I thought this was such an unusual path. And I maybe felt special because of that. What I've come to find is it's unbelievable how many people feel about their own path that they stumbled backwards into exactly the thing that they were meant to end up doing. And I always bring this up when I talk in academic settings or to students, because I think it's so important that if you ever look around and it feels like everyone else has sort of like figured out the one thing that they were meant to do and you feel like you're still chasing different interests, um, yeah, you're in good company. Um, so uh, when I went to graduate school, I went to Stanford University, and I was excited about that because they had this place that Trevor mentioned called the D School. It's a lowercase d, which is a reference to design in the lowercase sense. And what that means is design is a tough word to grasp. It means so many things, website design or fashion design. This was a reference to what got referred to as design thinking or human-centered design. I'm seeing a bunch of head nods. Um, which always scares me because it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people as well. Um, but what I experienced there was totally life-changing for me. And it was life-changing because for the first time in an academic or even a professional setting there in Silicon Valley, I got a sense that there was a way of working um, that I could, I could sink my teeth into. There was a way of working that emphasized collaboration and creativity and impact and all these kinds of things that I just found so enthralling. And so um, it was there that I met my wife and I ended up on the faculty of that program that I had been a student in. This is a photograph of me. You can't tell if I'm a graduate student or a teacher because the lines there are very blurred. I was a teacher in this setting. Um, and. Uh, in my time there, I ended up having a few observations about the design thinking world or the human-centered design canon, um, which were things that you know, I've been chasing now for the last decade. And it was questions about design and innovation and why it seems like those things are oftentimes tied up in certain types of organizations, but inaccessible to other types of organizations. And the ones that I was most interested in which were the ones that seemed like they left the biggest impact on how people live their lives, which is how people navigate a library or an airport or a hospital or a school or a police department. Those were the types of settings that we've since called public serving institutions. Those were the ones where design and innovation, all this energy you'd see in the technology corridor in Silicon Valley, it seemed so far removed. And, um, that was a real head scratcher for me about why if we have all this energy around design and innovation and we're clear that there are these really valuable domains to be applying it into, why isn't there a more natural intersection? Um, and so it was that conversation among some others um, that Lena, uh, my wife, um, I'm her husband, it's both, um, she and I were having um, when I met a uh, a student in a class of mine. Um, I was teaching at Stanford and we were teaching this class on design leadership. And we invited four executives to leave their position um, and come enroll in this class. And so it was four people, one of them dropped out. And so there was a replacement and that replacement was a man named Michael, Michael Brennan. And he was a leader um, in uh, Detroit of uh, one of the larger um, charitable organizations called the United Way. And it turned out that he was asking the same questions that Lane and I were. And so he invited us to come spend a week with him in Detroit. And um, by the end of that week, we were really clear, uh, Lane and I, we were really clear that that was what we were going to do next in our life. So we got married that summer, hopped in my truck, and we drove out and, um, and started a new life for ourselves in Detroit, Michigan. And it wasn't that long um, after the fact that the three of us started um, imagining a new organization. And the organization had a name before it had any strategy. 
and you can see it on Trevor's socks over there. We called it Sevilla. And that was the blending of the word civil um, or pertaining to the concerns of ordinary people and a village, which was just an acknowledgement that change never happens absent community. And so what we ended up doing is pooling some of our own resource and renting a physical space. Um, this is in Midtown Detroit in a building called Techtown. It was their storage closet. So on the other side of this tarp here is a bunch of broken filing cabinets and desk chairs. And uh, we could rent it on the cheap because it was, um, you know, it was an underutilized space in that building. We were very clear that Sevilla, even though we didn't know what it was or what it did, we were very clear that it was a physical space. It, you know, it wasn't a laptop at a coffee shop. And so we had enough money for one season and we just called it in the, you know, human centered design canon, you refer to prototypes. We called this whole thing a prototype where we were just going to experiment our way forward. And at the end of four months, it's totally possible this entire thing would implode and there would be like nothing to it, and we'd all have to go find a job again. Uh, but that was the bet that we were making. And so um, it looks a little bit fancier now if you were to come visit. We still rent the space, but not much. You know, it was concrete floors and utility lights and, um, and drywall. And what we started doing was opening up this space to different members of the community. We started teaching some things that we understood that we thought others would be interested in. People started showing up. Um, different groups started convening in different manners. And, you know, it was a totally magical time. You know, it, it, um, we all still look back on that time very fondly, even though we, you know, had no health insurance and, you know, weren't paying ourselves kind of thing. It was a very romantic um, effort. Um, and at the end of four months, we still did not have a strategy or like a, you know, there was no business plan for what we were trying to do. Um, but we'd thrown enough spaghetti at the wall, if you know that metaphor, to feel like there was um, something we wanted to keep pushing on. And uh, in the absence of more strategic language, um, we found one image which became this symbol for um, for that problem that I mentioned, you know, we've been scratching our head on ever since. Now, I want to just pause for a moment on this image. You might have seen this on campus. You know, this like happens literally in the world. This looks like it may have been a campus. You can see it most clearly when there's snow because suddenly people don't have a specific path to walk on. But it's not really meant to be a literal depiction as much as a symbolic one. And it's an important symbolic one because institutional planning is a muscle that we have worked on so deliberately for decades and decades, maybe centuries. And it involves really good intentions of identifying a problem, coming up with the best practice, and putting all of the resources you have available into a solution. And so I'm sure that whoever paved this brick path um, did so really with the best strategy and resources they could conjure. And maybe you've been a part of moments, you know, big or small, where you've been a part of laying these kinds of paths. In institutions, it has an implication, though. There's an implication when we design these paths intended to govern really important experiences and resources. But what gets designed in the center is the institution's needs. And what are institutional needs? Well, it's the money, it's the policy, it's the technology, it's the politics, it's the culture, it's the business process. It's all the internal things that organizations work so hard on um, organizing. And what happens? You know, person charts their own course and a first order observation for leaders is, doesn't that person know they're supposed to be on the path that we made for them? 
And that's a little like VCR manufacturer saying, don't you know, we created this 200 page VCR manual to help you understand how to program the clock on your VCR. Bad reference in a group of young people, but if you've ever heard of a VCR, yes. That's a first order kind of defense uh, reaction. We did the right thing. It's on them to figure out how to meet us where we are. It takes a much more unique kind of leader to say, hmm, maybe we got too far from that perspective. Maybe there were things that we might have learned from that perspective that could have influenced our decision making. And if we had, what would the outcome have been? Well, we might have created a path that was shorter. It might have been more expensive. It would have been more enduring. It would have delighted the person using it. It would have worked better for them. We could have achieved our business objectives, our organizational objectives, and met that person where they were at the same time. But there's a problem, an impediment to doing that, which is it is a totally different muscle to go and seek out that perspective, to know when to seek it out, to know how to seek it out, to know what to do with it once you have. It's a different muscle than our institutions have been developing. And so Sevilla, the SOC organization, it got put into the world on the hunch that there were leaders that had been through this movie enough times that they knew how change initiatives were going to end before they started. They could squint and they could see the path. And we started meeting people that grew our confidence that those kinds of leaders were out there. So if you hear me throughout this all talk about the person on the path, that's what the reference is to. So um, while we were in the midst of that prototype season, Michael, who I mentioned earlier, you know, we're throwing spaghetti at the wall and he shows up with this thing and he slams it on the table and says, well, what do you all think about this? And he said, well, what is this? And he said, well, I've been carrying this around in my briefcase. You all remember a briefcase. I've been carrying this thing around for six or seven years. And this might be the perfect example in practice Of the person on the path. He said, well, what is this thing? And if, I'll ask you, actually, maybe Trevor, because you're on the far side of the room. So he had taped it together one page at a time. And we said, well, what is this thing? And he said, well, this is, come to find out, this is the DHS 1171, the 1171 application. And if you are in Michigan, which we are, and you are applying for any of the state of Michigan's five largest benefit programs, that's Medicaid or health insurance, it's SNAP or food assistance, it's child care subsidies, it's um, state emergency relief, which is typically uh, utility assistance, and it is um, TANF cash assistance. This, and by the way, two and a half million of our 10 million, a quarter of the state ends up navigating this system and if you are to apply for it, this is what you're asked to complete. For the folks at home, there are eyes popping out of their heads right now. Yeah. And, and in some ways, you know, it's surprising. In other ways, there are versions of this all over the place. And there have been for a very long time. You know, not every application like this has question 17 which asks for the date of conception of your children. Not date of birth. So it's like, where, where does that go is one good question. A second question is when you see something like this, what can you do about it? We learned over 35 years there have been five full-scale efforts to dismantle this. Efforts that hadn't gotten over the finish line. It was still like this. So what happened with those five full-scale efforts when presumably there were 
capable, intelligent, creative, committed, professional experts that set out to bring change to something like this, but it didn't happen. And I'm sure that everyone in this room could go into a police station, could go into a library, could go into an airport, and you would find some version of a thing where you're just scratching your head saying, why did we do it like this? I've become a lot less self-righteous about that question since I've been working in systems like this, where my appreciation has grown that there tend to be a lot of reasons. You could like the reasons or not, but there tend to be a lot of reasons why this is the way that it is. Oftentimes it comes down to things like there was a lawsuit. And so we added those questions there. Or there was a concern. And so this thing got added there. And it turns out the adding is a lot easier than the subtracting. So this for us became, um, you know, that was our organizational strategy. And this became sort of the real life symbol of person on the path in practice. So yeah, this is 42 pages long. It's got 1200 questions and it's got more than 18,000 words, which is longer than Shakespeare's Macbeth. If you ever sat through that play. So um, we ended up taking a look at this through a, a few different vantage points. And I mentioned that we had already become this kind of place where different volunteers were showing up wanting to learn. And we didn't have any resources to speak of at that point. And so we ended up forming a community group that was dedicated to taking the first step that we've come, come to really feel conviction around the first step that you might do when you see something like this. And it involves, um, it involves listening. It involves listening with a kind of care and depth and craft that exceeds casual listening. And our team ended up listening to person after person after person, not the best practices expert, not the policy specialist, but people that were just navigating this application. For us, that is the, the expert on these things. And so, um, you know, the things that we were hearing for us, as you would imagine, are were concerning about people's experience navigating this. And we made a cold call. Um, you know, Mike had been in this domain for quite some time, but the people he had known in that institution, MDHHS, Department of Health and Human Services, they had left the organization. So he didn't have um, someone he knew there, but he got a referral to someone who gave him a phone number and he called that person up. And um, two leaders from the state ended up driving down from Lansing to come spend about 90 minutes with us. And it was Mike on a cell phone in a parking lot saying, you don't know me, I don't know you, I'm in a storage closet, we're in this temporary organization, but we're hearing these things, these stories of individuals that I think you have to hear. And, um, you know, we give them all the credit in the world. They surely had a to-do list that was the blank, but they drove down. And they were moved. You, you see the same application here that I have on the ground. You see it on the wall and onto the ground. And they said, you know, honestly, we've just never seen it this way. You know, we were talking about the, you know, the digital experience walking up here. If you see this as a PDF, it looks just as bulky as a one page PDF. So, you know, the visual artifact of this had an impact. What they said um, ended up changing the trajectory of the organization. They said, well, you're only hearing part of the story. It's great that you went out and listened to residents, but that's not the full story. We have 5,000 dedicated and skilled state workers that distribute help through this system every day of the week. What if you went and did an equal amount of listening to folks on the other side of the desk? And in that moment, um, a new 
framework for the organization emerged? It's for, for you, I went with it. Um, Canadian coin. Um, in most of my design thinking training, I got so accustomed to focusing on an individual or a user group. And the reason for that is too often a whole ecosystem of users crops up, what you call stakeholders or relevant parties. And there can be so much input that actually the person on the path gets lost. Um, what I came to appreciate is that in complex services, oftentimes you don't get to where you're trying to go for one user group without understanding those that they're interacting with. This is a gateway into a system and there's a gatekeeper and they have their own experience. And so we did an equal amount of listening with, um, with government staff, social workers, caseworkers and the like. And we started mapping and charting all the things that we were hearing. This is a volunteer scribbling on a wall. Um, and the agreement was, if we do all this listening with your staff, um, you have to come back down. And we're going to walk you through the two sides of the coin. And they did. They agreed to that. You know, I mentioned the prototype season of fall. This was all happening in the fall. They came down in a January um, winter's morning. And they brought two more people. They brought the very head of the department and they brought um, someone that gets referred to as the governor whisperer, like the government's person. Got two cell phones, one just for the governor. And so they got off the elevator um, on the floor that, that we had rented space on. And what they found were um, a row of seats. And in those seats were our volunteer community team for pretending to fill out an application. There were four seats available to them. We pumped in the noise of an office and we said, welcome to our DHS office, please have a seat. We handed them the application and asked them to start filling it out. For three of the four of them, it was the first time they'd ever seen this. And I don't say that critically. You can say, well, how do they not know about this? But this is a $25 billion a year organization. They have, they have to delegate things. They can't be in everything at a time. So I don't say that to poke a finger in their eye. I say that it was new context for them. And it's not that they suddenly understood the experience of someone navigating this, but they did have a first person embodied experience. They got to question 17 and looked at each other like, what is this? And so after 15 minutes, we said, time out. Let's imagine you'd gotten through this, which of course they hadn't. We've just spent all this time listening to the two sides of the coin. We want to walk you into what happens when you turn this thing in. And so in our space, we rolled out a different piece of paper. This is called a journey map, which is one of the kind of classic artifacts you'd see in human centered design process. It's different than a, a process map. A process map would be the kind of artifact you'd see in institutional planning where something always hits the diamond and always goes either left or right and reaches you know a desired outcome this is totally subjective this is a story this is not everybody but they had never seen the two sides of the coin interacting with the system narrated in a format like this and so this walk it's about 80 pages or 80 feet there. And it takes about seven or eight minutes to get through. You have to walk through the entire story. And by the end, you yourself feel depleted. Like it's an exhausting story to hear. And I'll give you the punchline. It doesn't go so well at the end. In fact, you end up right back to the start. And so these four leaders on that January day had just had a first person embodied experience. They had just grown their context about these two sides of the coin and this sub totally subjective story. It's not a universal story. It's not a population. It's not a data set. There's no statistical significance, but it was hundred percent plausible. You know, at the end of a journey like that, you might expect them to say, well, that was just one person. And that's not what they said. 
they agree that sometimes it's a shorter journey. And sometimes it's like three times as long. But that's maybe roughly right. And so we walk them into uh, an exhibit that we created. This is um, a woman who's a very dear friend of mine. Her name is Dr. Latina Denson. I won't tell you her whole story right now since we're live streaming. It's just a little bit um, weird to do that. But um, she was the, the first person that we talked to navigating this application. And the, um, the broad details of her story was um, totally amazing woman um, running her own business, um, had gotten a doctorate from the University of Maryland, and at age 35, woke up in the middle of the night and had something happening to her body that she didn't understand until she later learned that she'd had a massive stroke, had gone into a coma, um, and like totally changed the trajectory of her life. It's like no one's planning for that. No one's expecting that's just going to happen to you, but it happens to people. You're walking down a path and then boom, one day you've lost the ability to walk, to talk and to use your right hand. And so uh, she ends up relying on this application to navigate help. She relies on her mom to figure out how to complete this application. Her mom has to rely on an attorney to figure out how to navigate this application. And Latina spent the last 12 years like navigating the system. And so her subject matter expertise and the value of her perspective on what makes sense and what doesn't, on what makes her feel strong and what doesn't, on what is actually helpful and what isn't, is unparalleled in terms of its value. But you can't get to that story on a survey. You can't get to that story and the wisdom accompanying it with almost any of the industrial era oriented institutional planning techniques. It requires a, an approach in which enough trust gets created between two people that do not know each other, that in some ways have no basis for trusting each other, but a certain kind of space gets created where one person feels comfortable enough sharing what they actually think with a stranger to entrust them to steward that in a way that can be helpful. And you can't necessarily develop a friendship with everybody that you have that conversation with, but that's what happened with Latina. She's become a very dear friend to the organization and has continued to help support and advance this work ever since. She was just visiting us about two weeks ago. And what she would say is, I'm happy to entrust my story to you but in essence, for the love of God, do something with it rather than just make it like an interesting thing that you heard. And so I reference her with her permission to reflect the value of systems like this slowing down, not focusing on a population, but focusing on an individual. And it turns out that when you have a number of such conversations, there are certain patterns that start to emerge. This is where some of the canon on human-centered design ends up being helpful. You talk to enough people, you start to hear patterns. It's not that everybody isn't totally individual, but we do have shared experiences. And so we walk those leaders through a number of these kinds of patterns. Things like people felt like they were in a maze when they entered this system. They knew there was like an exit somewhere that they could get out but it would take a cosmic force to get from where they are to where they're trying to go. Or they feel like they're treated like a number, like you're a case number, you're referred to as a case number. No one zooms in to see my story to understand what I'm specifically navigating or where I'm specifically trying to go. It feels like a fraud prevention system, not a caring system. It's us versus them. There's a contentious dynamic. And yet all of the power, all of the status is on the other side of the desk. Latina's grandmother would say, I'm made to feel like I'm a child. This is a suit and a little kid's jacket hanging up in this walkthrough space. In the moment that we're trying to support, we belittle. And so they are receiving all of this information 
And then we get to the other side of the coin. This is Akila. She was one of the first caseworkers that we met that works in the Hamtramck office. And I'll tell you, when we sat down with those caseworkers, we assumed the worst because we had just heard all of these stories of people navigating the system, clashing with the state and the state workers. They would call state workers and they'd never get a call back. They found state workers to be unhelpful, to have the wrong kind of attitude. And so in our mind, we were thinking, well, now we're going to get to the culprit. It's something about them or their training or their attitude. And when you meet Akila, it's like a total because she has as well-trained, compassionate, engaged, invested as anyone you would ever want to run into in a moment of need. And so these two things like didn't map, like why was Akila letting, you know, like calls go straight to voicemail rather than picking up the phone? Come to find out when you keep talking to people, there are patterns. Just like on the other side of the coin, you know, Akila and her coworkers get involved to be problem solvers, to serve as people. And they end up feeling like they're a cog in a machine. They service the system. They can only ever do surface level work. They are highly aware that it's like an iceberg where there's a huge mass underneath the surface, but they never have the capacity, not the desire, they never have the capacity to go deep. And so they're eligibility workers. They determine whether you're eligible for the program. When she started, you know, she would have 300 cases in her caseload. And I don't know about you, I've never tried to take care of 300 individuals, let alone the families surrounding those individuals. But that sounds like a daunting task. By the time we spoke to her, her caseload was at 845. We've met social workers. And if you're in the school of social work, you might want to close your ears right now. We've met caseworkers with well over 1,100 cases in their caseload. And so how could you possibly expect someone that was so capable and well-intended to keep providing like world-class service and responsiveness when they were set up to totally fail at doing that. And so what happens, this was another artifact hanging up in our space made by a volunteer who had never used paper mache before. You go in with a huge heart and the system just compresses and compresses. There's no way to survive in a system with your heart that wide open. Can't do it. So we set up this whole thing, you know, it was like a totally weird alternative to PowerPoint. <laughs> but maybe you can tell from the tone of my voice, I still feel emotion around the advocacy and stewardship of these stories of the things that we've heard and learned and of my desire to try and influence leaders of a system like this, who I found to be well-intending, but felt needed to work in a different way in order to get somewhere different. They would say things like, I feel like when you, when you get them quiet, not these leaders in particular, but you hear this kind of thing, I feel like we can rent change. But invariably things like swing back. Like you can set up a new program, but it never seems to stick. And so they started like revealing these like really interesting and kind of vulnerable perspectives. Ultimately, we landed them back to the human centered design canon on a prototype. I'm going to have to speak faster. Um, we said if you were to take this application and design it through the eyes of the two sides of the coin, it would look something like this. I could walk you through 200 different details of this thing that weren't my ideas. It wasn't that I thought it should look like this. We just kept putting ideas in front of people representing the two sides of the coin and them saying, no, that's not it. Or, yeah, that's kind of neat. Let's go with that. 
in a lot of design, this is a, the cynic and skeptic in me, in a lot of design thinking settings, this can be like the end of the road. Like we have the prototype, you guys are the institution. We're gonna give you the prototype and then you. Sorry, everyone at home. You do something with it. That's your capability, you're the institution. I think I thought that in this moment. They said there's one problem. In order for us to go use this, we said well, you should pilot it. It's like a, a thing institutions do, like go try it in a couple settings and see how it goes. They said in order for us to try it with even one individual, I wish I had brought this with me. We have this in our space as well. It's like this tall. That application needs to satisfy the requirements of the Bridges Eligibility Manual, the BEM. We said, well, could we see the BEM, please? And they gave us a PDF. It looks so neat and tidy until you print it out. And you come to appreciate that this application is governed by 1,740 pages of federal, state, and departmental policy. You want to change this? Cool. Go for it. And so me, I was like, well, this has been great, guys. Thank you. You know, like, I think I hear someone calling my name over there. Lena, um, at every juncture like this, said, no, 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 we're going to keep going. And she ended up um, spending six months studying that policy manual. And she learned it as well as anybody could learn it. She studied 49 other states' worth of applications. So when institutional opinions came up, like, there's no way we could ever change that, she could say, actually, there is. Let me show you three other states that took a different approach. That was a different path from going as a generalist that wants to help to focusing on developing the domain expertise required to have an emoticon of credibility in a system that's like an old growth forest. You could chop the whole thing down. You could rent the change. It's going to grow right on back. And so six months of work with these policy teams, and we came up with a new prototype. You see it on the right. There's another 200 inputs that I don't have time to describe right now on this. And this was pilotable. And so our teams ended up working with the same social workers to figure out how do you start processing applications in a way that was like a hack because the system wasn't set up to receive them. And that was the first time that we had any quantitative data in this entire project. I started talking about populations and programs and public policies that are all accountable to large groups of people. But we got this far with qualitative data, with stories, with guidance and feedback and input one at a time. And we had a more robust proposal than you could possibly hope for any other path. It was Latina's perspective that made this possible. We could not have gotten here any other way. And so we baked into the pilot structured quantitative data. Because it turns out, and I'm guessing everyone in this room already holds this opinion, that by the time you are talking about making a change, for a population accessing a program governed by public policies, the anecdote isn't enough to carry the day. And it shouldn't be. I'm not here saying it's a viable alternative. Our team's perspective is that where you structure quantitative analysis matters a lot. And it might not be in the first third of a project like this. But we ended up being able to demonstrate how the completion rate grew with every iteration the accuracy grew it looks like it's falling there but that's time spent correcting errors and ultimately the thing traveled through the system 42 percent faster like if you work on the line at ford and you figure out a way to save half a, a penny on a truck that's like a big deal when this thing is getting processed two and a half million times like 42 percent increase in speed is a head turner that was another moment where I was like, cool, 
now you got it. We demonstrated this thing works and they engaged us for one last round of work on this all. And I'm going to speed through this. I'm going to try to speed through this so we can chat a little bit. But this is another moment where design is often critiqued for not going the distance. But the design of a thing, which is all we had, is very different than the implementation of it. And there is chronic devaluing of what it takes to implement even a small new idea, let alone a very big new idea. And so we ended up developing a whole approach. And this is maybe half or two thirds of the work of getting hundreds and hundreds of different people from throughout the state through that same story. Caseworkers, yes, but also union representatives and politicians leaders of adjacent agencies and so forth. We ended up doing an equal amount of work on the technology because you design it for paper. We think that's very strategic starting with paper, story for another day, but it's not the same as designing it for technology. And so it's an equal amount of work for that different setting. We ended up designing a different training protocol that had the social workers that had been involved in the pilot telling their peers like, here's what I thought when these guys showed up and then I actually tried this thing and I'm here saying you should give it a shot, which is not something that you can fabricate. And then they ended up conducting these in-person, you know, like a train the trainer kind of thing, in-person trainings based on what we learned about how people in the state are normally introduced to new changes, which is like, here's a webinar, you click through the 60 pages in two minutes and then you're done kind of thing. This became a half day experience. And you see here a lot of creativity amongst the different offices where they took the old forms and they turned them into purses or they created fire starters out of them. And we got maybe 50 or 60 photographs like this, which was an early signal that it was starting to leave our hands and starting to be adopted beyond our tiny little team. Um, we were told to anticipate, like we we're told literally to create a war room. For three months, we needed a war room following the launch. It launched to crickets. It's not that it's perfect. It's not that like there are, haven't been continual improvements to it. But it was like someone just slipped one thing out and added the alternative. And that's not because we're so smart. It's not that we had the answer. It's that we had just spent so much time understanding the implications of this change and addressing that, but by the time the launch button happened, it actually wasn't that huge of a deal. If you go um, to a DHS office around the state, there's well over a hundred of them. You now see that paper application, the digital equivalent, which is called MyBridges, um, you know, regularly receives all sorts of accommodation, commendation, all sorts of recognition um, for being a best in class service this has opened up our eyes to how this application sits in a much bigger system related to the renewals of program access the communications that go out between the department and their constituents uh, the speed of processing how we process internally this opened up a seven-year body of work like we still work with this same agency which for design organizations like ours is really rare you know, we're much more accustomed to like a 12 or a 16 week sprint, not like an eight year relationship. But it's unbelievable the opportunities that present themselves when there's a kind of relationship that's been established in trust and integrity. Where we've gotten to work on incredible things that have had really significant impact. It has since spilled over into adjacent agencies in state government in Michigan like the Secretary of State's office. If you renew your driver's license, you'll notice it's a lot different than it had been about four years ago. That was this team um, doing a lot of work in unemployment insurance. If you lose a job and you file for unemployment during the pandemic, those systems across the country really showed they weren't up to the task. Uh, we do a lot of work in child welfare system, how you get licensed as a foster parent, what happens when children are removed from homes, um, there are technical systems that under, underlie all those things that can exacerbate the problems. We're working on things like that. And we're now um, working in two additional states than Michigan to try and understand how what the state here was able to achieve 
could be achieved also in the state of Connecticut and the state of Washington. Um, I could talk to you for another hour about some of the things that we feel like we've learned. I, I'm not going to do that because um, I would love to just carve out, you know, 10 minutes or so for us to chat. We don't think there's a blueprint or some equate. I mean, that's the whole point of the story is that like we didn't, you know, like we didn't find the one true way to bring institutional change to life. Um, there were ingredients and those are ingredients we're still trying to understand uh, and maybe have started to promote even. And it's things like finding a problem that everybody can understand. Everybody in this room understood this problem. I did not need to explain it. You have to stay close to the user. It's not enough to do it like once and get a checkbox. And that's a practice that will pay dividends. Now, if you maintain it as a practice. We can't do any of this work without courage in other leaders. And that's not all leaders. There's a big difference between a leader and a courageous leader. We're doing our best to try and identify from the outset what that is because we know we're going to call upon it. Like there are uncomfortable moments in this story for leadership. And we have no formal authority. Find a key domino. We didn't talk much about that, but there's like a hundred other things in that journey map that you could have focused on. I mentioned like the, the voicemail, like we could have spent an equal amount of time on the phone tree, but we got clear that that did not have disproportionate impact like this gateway into the system has. And so there's another thing about that of like all projects are not equal. Some have a dis disproportionate leverage. Orienting towards the long haul, change takes more than design. Man, we've just worked so hard to design an organization as fallible as the next organization, but that is oriented around long haul work. And this is relevant in this school for sure, because it takes nurturing yourselves and one another in a very deliberate, sustained approach in order to stay in the game. So like our team takes more time off than almost anybody. I am, you have summer off. So it's not fair here, but compared to our peer organizations, we take an unbelievable amount of time off. And that's essential. You know, there are a lot of dimensions to our organization and the, the business of it that have been designed by saying, we got to create a culture that supports long haul work. Um, and then it's not enough, we find, to just point to the problem. You know, it's so easy. You could turn on the news any day and people will point to the problem. We found you get change going when you can point to a leader and say, here's the problem. And then also here's like a solution. And if you can create some kind of alignment in that, it's a very different thing than just saying you're doing a terrible job as a leader. Like, look at, look at the results. You know, and that's how actually it happens more often than we wish. Um, that's a villa. I had to promise two other things. One, um, we're on Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and we'd love it if you'd follow along. We put a lot of um, resources into trying to create this thing called Sevilla Stories, which you can subscribe to at the bottom of any page on Sevilla.com or .org. Um, it's a monthly newsletter, technically, but it's more journalism than it is like every third or fourth one will be about updates from our studio, but a majority of it is us interviewing leaders, um, trying to break down how institutional change has happened in different settings. It's a very optimistic um, thing. Um, and then importantly, we are hiring right now. Um, we grow very, very slowly. And so it'll surprise you to hear that we have opened up um, between four and six new positions um, that will be based in person in, in Detroit. Uh, you know, more on that if, if you're curious, but um, certainly any help that, that um, you could extend, you know, sharing that opportunity with people that you think might be interested in it, we'd really value. Um, so that is, oh man, I saved like four minutes on my clock, seven minutes on that clock. What's the official clock? Like we can go longer here. Okay. Um, not all of us can, but people can leave as they need to. If you to. have to leave, thank you very much for coming and hanging out. Thank you.
but I'm sure that there are questions. And um, if people don't have questions, I've got 20. So, um. Hi, Adam. Thank you so much for coming out and speaking with us today. Um, something why you were giving this whole like speech, I was just it was like really inspired by your type of work and how more human centered design could prevent catastrophes with the government rollout, both uh, in this specific example, but also things like the historically infamous rollout of the Affordable Care Act and like failures like that. Um, so how do you think we, I, I guess this is kind of antithetical to your talk, asking for like big solutions, like silver bullets, but like, how can we get more uh, government agencies to like kind of take this approach? Yeah. Um, does that question come through the internet as well? Yeah. People on the internet would have heard it. Yeah. Perfect. You don't need to repeat Although it. People on the internet. Um, I. For starters, you should know, and you might like to hear that the, the, the rollout that you reference on the ACA um, ended up really being a rallying call um, for people in the technology domain who had wanted to be a part of meaningful work to say, um, we've reached a place, uh, a point in the world where the role of technology is so intrinsically connected to government service delivery um, that our involvement uh, needs to be structured differently. And so there is a, a, a broad professional community. Sometimes it's called civic tech. Sometimes it's called PIT, which stands for public interest technology. And um, that sector has um, grown incredibly over the last, um, I'd say, eight to 10 years, um, such that it's now not all that uncommon for whether in the federal government, where there are some teams like one's called 18F and one is called USDS, uh, United States Digital Service. Um, so it's, it's not so uncommon for federal government agencies to be familiar with those services. Also at the state and the municipal level, you know, in Philadelphia and in Boston, there are teams that are oriented around this way of working. Um, we have um, created a thing we call Sevilla Practica, which is an online um, learning experience uh, intended for government workers, particularly in health and human services. Uh, what we've realized is that when you have broad, general, human-centered design um, methods and anecdotes, and you try and translate that as a government worker, it's like too big of a gap. There's just a gulf in it. And so we're trying to create resources that talk more directly to the experience that state workers have and uh, have started bringing cohorts of 40 at a time through this thing. That's sort of an attempt to build more internal capacity. but. I guess that would be my answer is I think there has in government specifically, there has been an awakening around the role of technology and, um, and yet there's just so much, so much ground to cover, you know? And so I, I don't always see myself squarely in that community. If only for the fact that I don't know anything really about the development of technology, it's not center of the table for us. It is a, like a tool amongst many at, for Sevilla. But I always try and encourage people that are interested in both service broadly and in the technology domain that there are some amazing organizations. Others you might run into, one's called NAVA, N-A-V-A. One is called Ad Hoc. And um, one is called Code for America. Um, also the Beck Center at Georgetown is a big contributor to that all. Um, as well as several folks at Balmer Group and um, Gates. So there is real m momentum, I'd say, in that direction, but a lot of, a lot of ground to cover for sure. Can I just intensify that question for a second? Um, I know that like a lot of people knew that this was wrong and said it to state government before you did it. Um, 
Do you, do you have any kind of, like, was it the amount of time you were able to take on this that made a difference? Or was it kind of coming from the outside, like from an entirely different um, space that kind of helped them hear you? Do you have it, any? It could have been a, a lot of things. You know, like the positioning of the messenger among them. Um, so I don't, I don't know for sure. I would guess it was several elements. I will say there's this term that Malcolm Gladwell used on a podcast that we have borrowed and maybe used incorrectly, but we say it all the time and it's called generous orthodoxy. And it's like a tenant uh, in our culture and our approach at Sevilla and generous orthodoxy. Orthodoxy um, refers to a respect, an honest respect for what's come before us. 35 years of failed attempts to change policy experts, policy documents, a lot of well-intended people. But the generous part of generous orthodoxy is also that our role is to stretch. It's not just to abide by what had been. And I'd say we're students of, and our, our CEO, Mike, is really an amazing teacher on, is how you weave a relationship where leaders feel heard and seen enough that they can be vulnerable and say, I really don't know how to fix this. I didn't, I inherited this. I don't know what we do about this. I'm open. But like, and the fact that like, yeah, when they first show up in our space, I got flush. Like I saw the enemy and I wanted to like go punch them in the nose probably, you know? Um, and I saw Mike like stick out his hand and say, you know, um, we're not here to poke a finger in your eye. We're here because we understand that you have some of the most complicated jobs out there. The volume and velocity of the work, the chronic lack of resources, the distributed oversight and regulations. We're only here because we are hearing these things that we think could be helpful to you. And we have an earnest respect for the system that you're part of. And you could see in that moment, these leaders that entered that weird storage closet, like their shoulders just dropped a little bit. Like, I'm not in enemy territory. And I think what can happen in a lot of these systems, I use the term self-righteous for myself, you know, uh, earlier. We can come in and be like, you guys don't even know, you know, you haven't fixed this already. and man, it's hard to influence somebody who doesn't like you, you know? And so bridging a relationship and like an earnest one, um, I don't think we have too many of those in change efforts like this. I'll just say that. Hi, I'm Karina. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Um, so I guess my question is related to what you were saying where there's a lot of bureaucracy around bringing stakeholders in to like change the way the system has existed for a long time. Yes. And we all know that the system is broken, you know, from personal experience, I've seen how family members have to wait months before they get access to unemployment benefits or be able to talk to a therapist, just get basic benefits to survive. Um, and so I'm curious to know, like from the projects that you have done, what has worked the most effectively to make progress at scale um, within an efficient time manner? So like, let's say for the DMV or even for this project that you did, um, does the project have to be proposed by those in leadership at these organizations? Or what What does your team do to bring all these different stakeholders in? Yeah, it's a, a few different questions you asked. I'll try and respond to um, I mean, this was not like a scope of work or an RFP, you know, this would, and it's got the, the texture on it of just like impassioned people trying to do something, you know, and that may or may not be some of the thing that got the ball rolling. Like if we had come as a very well-structured professional outfit, you know, we might've gotten a cold shoulder in a different way. So I, I, I bring that up to say that there might be something to that on just like the sweat of your brow going for it kind of thing. 
that's certainly where this all got started. That story has changed a lot over eight years. We just celebrated eight years. And um, we're now in a fundamentally different position than we've ever been in before. Um, and that includes things like leaders coming to us saying, could you help us do something on this like you did on that? And that's a very different posture than we had and quite a helpful one. You know, I mentioned hiring a moment ago. One of the reasons we're hiring is, you know, the, the greatest challenge that we have as an organization is capacity. Um, it's not resources, it's capacity. And, you know, there are 15 more projects than we could ever have the capacity to work on at, at a given time. And yet we don't grow quickly or much at all because of the impact that has on the relationships and the culture of the team end up just not being sustainable. So I think projects can start in a bunch of different ways. It can be just like you going for it. It can be your reputation has led you there. And certainly there are RFPs that, you know, organizations and leaders get clear. We need help on this area. Um, I don't know. Did I answer even a third of what you were asking about? Oh, yeah. It would be different depending on the project. This was one of the more complicated ones because um, this looks like one form, but it's like, a, you know, in organizations, you hear the word ecosystem used a lot, but this is like a whole ecosystem. And so I mentioned like in the stakeholder management, you know, strategy we had on the rollout, you know, it never occurred to me that we'd have to talk to union leaders. And now I see it so clearly, but back then I didn't see that they might view this as a workforce reduction strategy. Once this thing is super efficient, we could lay off 10% of our workforce and then we'd free up a bunch of resource to do other things. What was so fascinating about that walkthrough is how many different groups like that it could be politicians, it could be other agency leaders, it could be funders and donors in different ways. But they might show up thinking one thing and 45 minutes later, when they hear about the work that went into it, when they hear about the voices that were shaping this, when they see it as a labor of love, their perspective on it changes. And so like those union representatives ended up becoming champions for the way that this would reduce some of the workload on their staff only when they understood its intent and the intent of leadership, which was not about cutting the workforce, it was about making the workforce, you know, um, more feasible given its current size. So, you know, that was a complicated one. Some have been simpler. Uh, I'd say leadership is most of the time pretty aware of who those people, the people are that need to be in on it and up on it um, because it'll be a, like a, absolute pebble in their shoe if they don't bring those people along. Um, and then, you know, we're learning from other states that things are much, you know, they, they're structured differently. We thought Michigan was surely as complicated as it could be. And then we hear about how other states structure these kinds of things. And we realize we, we have a pretty good here. You know, um, for example, in California, on a lot of these kinds of systems, they have a county-based system which sounds great because counties are much closer to their constituents. But what that means, if you want to get a change through a system like that, it's not one technological system or one application as, I don't know about California specifically, but for example, you're now aligning federal government, state government, and county government and trying to weave change, you know, through maybe 20, 30, 40 counties. Well, that's, we have no idea how you do that well. You know, that that would be a whole other thing. So I think it's context specific. Um, but without too much imagination, I think you can kind of map, like, who are the people that are most affected by this um, and who will be angry if they weren't brought along, brought in on it. You know, there's a saying, it's kind of cheesy, but in on it and up on it. So they're not down on it. And that's been, you know, really like an important approach for us. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for your question. 
Hello. Thank you. This is a lot of um. Sure. Um. Yeah. Thanks so much for doing this work. Um. I have two specific questions. So the first one is, you know, obviously resistance to change does come from the stakeholders a lot of the times, but it's also the end users. Um, what mechanisms um, have you done in terms of like training um, the workers who are actually administering mm. these forms mm. um, to in order to get their buy-in? Mm. Um, so that's one. And then the second one, what is there a, a feedback mechanisms like over time that you're implementing or thinking about as well? Because, you know, something works until it doesn't mm -hmm. or, you know, there's a problem perhaps that you totally. didn't think of right now, can't think yeah. about it right now that may pop up in the future. Is there sort of a, a follow up? or a feedback or an evaluation process that Those you're thinking Those are great thinking questions. Um, to your first question, which was about, you know, how do we pursue training? And there was a, like another piece of that question, which was about like broader sense of perspectives, you know, in the community or amongst people that are using this. One of the advantages I know that we had in this was, this is what we'd call a system that wasn't working well for anybody. And, um, that's very different than working in a system where there's a strong incumbent presence where people are like trying to guard, um, you know, we found some of that resistance, um, and have, uh, I don't want to get into that story necessarily. We found some of that resistance internally and probably went about it in a way, certainly went about it in a way that we w didn't do again. Like we kind of steamrolled resistance, you know, in a certain moment that I'm thinking of. Um, but amongst residents and recipients in, in these programs, um, I think there was, I, I don't know if we ever ran into someone that felt a fondness for this system uh, or this application. And so bringing that group along was maybe not the complicated thing. What can be complicated is nobody fills this out alone. It's family, friends, neighbors, people at church. And whenever you make a statewide change, that informal network is an incredibly powerful force, big fan of it. But then you have a million people working with 2 million other people that all have different interpretations on like what is the thing. And on an application like this, um, that only raised the stakes on making sure that um, the questions, for example, were structured, even the wording, maybe especially the wording, was structured in such a way that there could be near unanimous understanding or agreement on what is this actually asking for. Um, because we knew there would just there would be so many different interpretations of anything otherwise. The question on training, um, we had a few different tenants, you know, that came from talking to a bunch of caseworkers about how they like to be trained. I mentioned earlier, like the webinar was just not beloved or effective, and so um, they wanted in-person training. They wanted to learn from their peers. And um, that sounded great, except for um, there are over 100 offices. So we knew that like we couldn't go deliver 100 trainings. And some of the information was technically so specific that I couldn't train you and expect you to go train your office without a game of you know, telephone or operator happening. And so we ended up relying on this mixture um, of videos that could get played in offices that would reflect the most um, sort of technically specific content where things had to be explained in a certain way in order to get the message across and then have things that were more related to, um, you know, some of the internal change, some of the feelings that people would have, some of the questions that people would ask, that those would all get laddered up to in-person facilitators from each individual office. That's what I meant when I said train the trainer. We trained something like 
100 or 200 people from across the state that all then became representatives in their offices. And that's something that basically didn't happen or certainly didn't happen as often as it probably needed to. Um, and that ended up being its own kind of feedback loop because we could keep in touch with, I think it was 100 people, maybe it was 200. Um, and they could say, hey, we keep stumbling on explaining this one thing or this question came up that I don't know how to answer something like that. Like that was a more manageable feedback loop. Um, you asked also about the broader feedback loop on almost what I interpret it as like the ongoing ending to this, you know, because what can happen is all this enthusiasm about one change, but then there's another lawsuit and someone wants to add a question back in or something like that. Um, a mentor of ours named D Hawk, uh, he counseled us on the role of antibodies like this application needs antibodies in the system to ward off. I don't know if the metaphor is germs, but it's, it's in essence to ward off, you know, um, things that would seek to return it back to how it had been. And there's a lot more to it than this. But one thing we ended up creating was um, this decision making tree, which almost sounds like an artifact of institutional planning. But it ended up having a surprising amount of influence um, that led to things like if you want to make a change to this application, it has to be tested with recipients first. And you wouldn't believe what it had turned that is. You know, wait, you want me to actually like go out and test this? Well, never mind. We'll find a different way. And so, um, what we did was help make the bar for adapting the application very high. And um, it went live, um, I think in 2017, and is largely intact to date. And I don't think we will ever feel comfortable that that will be smooth sailing um, you know, until the end of our days. So we continue to work with that leadership and continue to have our fingers on the pulse of it. But that needs work. And then, you know, someone brought up earlier, in essence, like, what about other programs that are under-resourced? Or, you know, it's not like you fill out the new application and everything is great. There's still unbelievable amount of progress available in this setting and, you know, others like it. Um, and that's why we're never really worried about running out of work, you know? Uh, it's also why I am here encouraging, at every chance I get, encouraging people to consider these kinds of pathways into systemic change. You know, what can happen, I think, in places like social work or policy is this pendulum swing. Maybe you're familiar with it, which is like, I'm going to work on the system because I'm really drawn to like big change. And then you realize you're so far away from the issue that you swing the other thing and you say, I'm going to work with people one at a time. And then you burn out because it's not systematic enough. And then like ultimately try and find, you know, the balance or the harmony on it. And it's why I, I tried to bring to this conversation just a little bit of a balance on saying there is a way of working on large systems change that continues to prioritize dialogue with individuals. And I, um, I'm, I've just seen enough to feel like we need a lot more of that. And um, I hope if anything, this is, you know, a little bit of um, sunshine and, and, and rainwater on those seeds um, in you. Uh, Cause I think, you know, if you just look at the state of our public serving institutions, it can be difficult to maintain optimism. And yet that's exactly what is needed in order to make any kind of constructive change. So that's a core dimension of why Sevilla is in the world of just trying to bring optimism into these settings, because we really believe that public serving institutions are vital and that they um, do have brighter days ahead. So. I probably should put a pin in it. There, yeah. Unfortunately, um, are we still online? We are still online. Um, 
Well, I'll just say uh, my email address is adam at org. If anyone online has been listening this long, I guess you get my email address as well. Um, and if it's ever helpful to come um, to reach out, you're, you're always welcome to do that. And thanks a lot for letting me come spend an hour and 15 minutes with you on this Friday morning. <laughs>